you know, two fences around the garden so they don't, so it discourages them from jumping in. Uh, have you ever heard of that? Well, have you? Well, I, I have. First of all, I have. But yeah. Have you, uh, have you had a problem with the deer jumping fence? Uh, well, it's been broken for a while, so they've been oh. <laughs> free, free ranging for a little oh. bit. So I need to retrain them now, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> Because my fence is only six foot high, but I have, uh, you, you missed the first class, I'm pretty sure. Uh, yes. I should show some photos on that. So actually, if you went back to the, to the audio or the video recording, I guess, for the first mm -hmm. class, you could see some, some examples of that. Okay. Uh, I, have seen, I have seen a deer jump that fence um, before I actually got my gate in. The year I was putting the fence up, I walked in one morning and I just had this something rolled in front of the in front of the gate and i guess the deer just pushed it away yeah so we stared at each other from from opposite ends of the garden and the deer just kind of jumped the fence but it took about four attempts and it finally just fell over oh, so okay. i know it could jump six foot it probably could jump seven foot if it had to but i don't think they would unless they really had to Right. So I think once you fix up that initial fence, I don't think you'll need that second one. The second okay. one is is effective if you're if you have a short short much shorter fence, because deer don't have very good depth. Well, they don't have any depth perception, I guess. Okay. So they can't tell how far the space is between the two fences. I think it's because their eyes are on different sides of the head or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I don't I don't think you'd need it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you looking for like input or like feedback? Because I could help with some sure. of that just because my husband happens to be quite into hunting and deer and all. Um, and we keep corn in our front field. We only have to put string around it, not even fencing. When they touch it, they get very skittish and nervous. And I've had deer stuck inside fencing and to try to get them out is impossible. They don't tend to jump, especially not at night. So that's when they're going to come into your garden. But at right. nighttime, they're more reluctant to make those kinds of jumps. So even just having string around it and they hit their nose against that, that's enough of a deterrent. They start getting skittish. Oh, I can try that too. Yeah. And then it's uh, a lot cheaper than having to go pull out. Double fencing is not necessary. Yeah, I'm looking for an inexpensive solution. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. At just um, like fishing line. You know, that's enough. Oh, I got you. Okay. Not strong enough to keep them out. They're not going to start walk, walking through it because they don't know how to get themselves back out of it. Yeah. Okay, if that does, helps. does it do any good to tie? Like I tie sometimes like fluorescent tape and on the fence itself. I don't does... think it's so much what they see. It's really just them feeling it. That's going to be right. enough to deter them. The minute their eyes and their head or their nose are touching something, they're walking away from it. Yeah. At the other end because it's more like trapping and it makes them nervous and they don't want to get stuck. Yeah. I tell you one thing I did not miss. Question mark. Yeah. Go ahead. Then. Okay. Thanks. Hope that helped. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Diane, and welcome. I think it's your first time. Oh, Please. sorry. Thanks for having me. Sure. I know I was the last minute jump on. That's right. Appreciate that. Yeah. You've earned your you've earned your keep already. Oh well, thanks. <laughs> hey, yeah, thank you. I'll I'll throw in more as I come, but I'll get out of the uh, the conversation. I'm I'm a talker, so I'll I'll mute myself now. <laughs> um, may I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Um, this is Adiro Hi, Solomon. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a question about um rotation. It's sort of like a rotation crop question. I'm growing radishes in a raised bed. Um, in a box, basically, in one section of the box, like one two-foot section. Um, but then later on in the fall, I wanted to grow um, turnips within the same box, but in another section. Is that too close? Because I know you're not supposed to plant, um, or you shouldn't plant, um, turnips after radishes. Mm -hmm. And so if they are in the same, they were planted, like one was planted in the spring, one was planted in the fall, but within the same box in two different places, would that affect the turnips later in the season that are grown in the fall. Yeah, I mean, it could. The, um, the, the issue there is disease. And I don't remember what the disease is. It's a root disease or root club, something like that. Uh, and it apparently stays in the soil for three years. But I would think if you, you know, you have a, a I assume your, your raised bed is not huge. No, uh, it's, um, I, it's like four feet square. Yeah, um, I, I I would go ahead and try it. Uh, I mean, most of the time, you know, you're not going to have a problem. 
Uh, I don't know that I've ever had that disease problem on my roots. So I, I, but I do rotate, so I try to avoid it. I think if you can avoid that, that's fine, but I, don't, I think you'll probably be all right. The main problem I've had, well, I'll talk about turnips later because I am going to talk about the fall. So I'll, I'll get into the, the, the main problem I've had with turnips, which is not disease. Oh, okay. Um, the only reason why is because I normally plant radishes in the spring and I rotate what box I put them in every single year mm -hmm. so that it's like a three-year rotation with the radishes. I just thought maybe in the fall I could try a turnip, but if I can put them in another box if it's really going to be an issue. So I guess I'll wait till I hear about your turnip talk to see if Okay. I should sort of switch to another box. If you have the option to switch to the other box, I would. Okay. Uh, I, I try not to plant any of the, the brassica, that's the brassica family, um, mm -hmm. cold crops, I guess. Um, I try not to plant any in the same place three years in a row if, and longer if I can avoid it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we, we obviously have to keep on an eye on the communities around this as well. Okay, so I'm going to mute everybody, not because I don't want to hear from you, but because I fear that there's a little bit of interference. So um, what I can tell you to do is basically, if you want to talk, just unmute yourself, okay? <clears throat> Yeah, and Nagisa, if you can keep an eye out in the chat box, for, I'm not going to be able to talk. I uh, am. Yeah. So. Well, um, Kim, did Kim ask a question just now? Do you want to pile in? Because I think you had a chat question. Go ahead, Kim. We got a few minutes. You, she, um, she says. Go ahead. Let me read her question. I'm having the opposite situation in that my tomato plants are large and starting to see a couple flowers. Obviously, I need to hold off on planting until at least the middle of next month. Online, I saw that I should pick them off. Uh, pick the flowers off, was that? Yeah. Yeah, I would. I, I pick them off. Uh, I, I don't know if, 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 Kim, if you were with us the first class, I think it was, but um, I talked about picking off the, the lower branches of the tomato plant when you transplant them and trying to bury it up to the um, whatever branch you've left. And I would do the same with the flowers too. Uh, there's, a, there's a bit of stress in transplanting, and um, I don't think you'll get much out of those flowers. They'll probably die anyways, and I think the plant is better off if you just uh, pick them off. Yeah, I would keep those tomatoes cold. Um, I mean, they, they, they do need sunlight, but it, it cold will, will um, hold them back. I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, as, a, as an aside before we actually get into tonight's main topic of... Um, <clears throat> keeping seedlings cold when necessary. All right, Al, I think you can probably start. Okay, our, our numbers are climbing still. Let me give it, mine says 820, now, uh, 620, now. I'll wait one more minute. All right. <laughs> <clears throat> But I can take one more question. <clears throat> well, I've got 6.30 right now, and I can start a little bit on slow side, which will get give people a few more minutes to get on, because uh, I want to start off by, again, thanking NOFA for putting this on and thanking the Unitarian Universalist Church of Washington Crossing for originally providing us a site for nothing, which allowed us to keep the, the, um, the cost of this down, um, even though we had to completely do it and, and put it on as, as a webinar. But uh, you know, thanks to both our sponsoring, uh, our sponsoring um, organizations. Um, and uh, I, I think you got a, a notice of this from, from Nagisa. 
Uh, but let me, I want to explain it a little bit. The, the NOFA board uh, decided this past week uh, because of the coronavirus uh, and the increased um, interest in, in growing our own food, making, making ourselves more self-sufficient in food, uh, and the, the increased number of calls that have come into our one-person staff, which is Nagisa, um, who has a limited amount of bandwidth, um, they, they decided to make these recordings um, that we're doing available to the public. Um, it's going to uh, it really cut down on, I think, the, the time Nikisa has, has uh, needed to talk to people. And it, um, uh, it, it, it will be NOFA's way of, of helping, uh, in helping out with the, with the adjustments people have to make to the pandemic. Now, when, we, when uh, I'm actually on the board also, so when we, when we talked about this, I said, well, you know, you guys have all paid for this. Um, is it fair to you? Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for having paid for this because it's allowed us to be able to afford to do this and put it up on the website. And um, uh, so what, we, what, we've, uh, what we're do, going to do in, uh, in, in uh, payment, I guess, for you guys, uh, is we've made, we're going to have another session on uh, the th Thursday, third or fourth Thursday in May. I think it's May 21st, if I'm not mistaken. Same time and same place. And I think Nikisa's has already sent out an invitation to everybody that's registered for the course. And I'm not gonna plan a curriculum unless I don't get to something I want to cover today. Um, but uh, we, it'll just be a question and answer. Um, so, uh, you know, we welcome everybody to come in uh, with a question and answer a, a month from today, or four weeks from today. And um, we're also gonna offer everybody a 10% discount Everybody who's on this call or either the previous calls, a 10% discount on NOFA's Winter Conference next year, which is the uh, last Saturday in January, I believe. And, and hopefully everybody will back, everything will be back to normal by then. So we, um, uh, so I, 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 again, I thank everybody for, um, for participating. It's allowed us to put this on uh, where NOFA can put it out to the general public, but probably do a lot of good. And um, hopefully, you know, you'll um, be able to take advantage of the next question and answer period and the, um, the discount on the winter conference. So, uh, so I guess- well, can, I, can I ahead. say a little bit? Sure. So um, folks, what, I, what I've noticed in the calls that I've been fielding is that there are a lot of people across our state who are hungry and really need to grow food. So I hope that you understand that we're just doing this because we want to serve the rest of the public who are struggling right now. And so um, please understand, we, we totally are, we really are grateful for everything you've done to sign up for this course, to support NOFA and to join in. And we, we really are enjoying this class. Um, but we also want to share the information with others because, you know, there, there's a lot of people in need across our state. And we hope that you can understand that and won't be too upset with us for doing that okay. so um thank you thanks for understanding okay i go ahead and share my screen i believe okay. Okay, so our topic for tonight is gardening into the fall. I nicknamed this feeling the chill, planting, harvesting, rotating, stretching the organic garden season. Um, before I actually get into the topic, there's a couple of things I want to follow up from previous weeks. Uh, and uh, number one <laughs> is these were my seedlings that I planted uh, in March as of this morning. Uh, I planted them all outside today. I would like to have had the, the, the uh, let me be, uh, grow a little bit larger. I do not have a grow light. Uh, uh, so this is what I was able to do in my window. When I, I had a, a greenhouse, when I was farming, um, I found I could get these plants about this stage in about three weeks. It took me five. So uh, that's probably a question I have for some of you guys that have your own grow lights. Are you finding you can get a transplantable seedling in about 
three weeks because uh, I find without a grow light, it took a, a couple extra weeks. I purposely tried to keep these cold. I didn't care if the weather was cold outside. I put them outside anyways because I wanted to I wanted to hold back their growth so they wouldn't get too leggy, and I was fairly successful at that. And the root systems in those, those uh, cells, with, well, I think they're two and a half feet by, I mean, two and a half inches by two and a half inches of the same depth. Um, it, it pretty much was filled up with roots, so they stay together. That's one of my concerns when I transplant, is if the, the roots don't uh, fill up most of the cell, that the soil falls apart and you get a bare root. Uh, and it's a lot better to, to plant them with the, the, with the soil. Um, I, I, I do give them a little bit of compost when I put them in the ground, but uh, several of you asked questions or had comments last week about uh, your, you plant the seeds and they're, they're growing, but they're growing really slowly. Um, it's pretty typical, the, the weather's kind of turned cold in, in April as opposed to part of the winter, which is above normal. Uh, and without warm days, you're not getting the biological activity in the soil, which actually is needed to release nutrients to the plant. So they are going a little bit slower. It's not anything you're doing wrong. Uh, I tried this morning uh, to give a little bit of the uh, uh, fish emulsion, which I talked about earlier, which is liquid fertilizer, because I think it's a little more readily available. Um, and I have only done that just because my things are going kind of slow also, and I want to see if I can speed it up a little bit. Um, whoops. Um, now this is a, uh, I want to go back to um, last week talking about, about weeding, and I tried to put this up as a video last week, and it didn't work, but I think it's important. I want to, I want to go um, over this one more time. It's one of, to me, it's one of the more important things I'll, I'll cover in this course. This is my shuffle hoe. And I'm going to show you, again, it's shuffling through the soil just below the surface. And I'm standing up straight. My thumb is pointing up. It's causing me to stand up straight. Uh, I, can, I can weed this way all day long. So if, I want to point out the importance of having a Great, Al, house. I've got another field for you. Another what? <laughs> A field for you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, I've done this for, you know, when I was farming, I did it for six, eight hours a day. And, and yeah, maybe my back was a little sore at the end of the day, but uh, I don't think any of us are in that, that size yet. Okay, so stretching the season. Why am I talking about this? This was, they, these were kale plants. I took this picture the day before Easter, uh, and they were planted, seeds were started on July 1st, uh, transplanted out uh, the end of July, early August, something like that. Uh, and we, as you see, there's nine kale plants there. Um, we've got plenty. We're not worried about, uh, you know, not having enough produce. Um, we don't eat kale every day. We still get some things left over in the basement, uh, some squashes, carrots, etc. cetera. But uh, we, we could almost eat every, kale every day. And I don't get this good a crop in the, the second year every year, but um, many years I do. Okay, um, I'm talking about being able to harvest lettuce in, in mid-November mid or later. I'm talking about having a full set of brassicas. Uh, you've got, again, you get more kale here. You see snow on the ground. It's, at, it's actually that uh, October 30th um, snowstorm we had a number of uh, years ago, but uh, Nebraska's are just coming in at that time, uh, just being harvested. I'm talking about having crops that we can put in the basement uh, that w we start midsummer, uh, you know, the various times in the summer, and I'll talk about the specifics. So uh, again, I think there's a lot of potential in here for us to stretch our garden season and make ourselves more self-sufficient. I specifically uh, I invited some people I know that they're uh, working on school gardens, uh, which I think fall, fall gardening is really appropriate because you don't have anybody there in the summertime. So I think uh, if, you can, if you can garden in the fall, it's a lot more appropriate for schools. And also, um, you know, some of you I know that are kind of um, on the verge of homesteading or our, our homesteading. I'm also talking about harvesting right through the winter. This is kale, uh, tradition, family tradition is to have kale and groundhog day, even if we have to dig it out from the snow. Uh, I'm talking about overwintering some crops in the in the ground. This is actually carrots. Um, uh, I I'll get into specifics of that later, and I'm talking about having things to store um, in the basement. 
um, various, uh, again, I'll talk about storage specifics. Okay, now there's a couple of aspects that we need to deal with. If you don't have good sunlight in the summertime, just barely have good sunlight in the summertime, you're gonna have, you may struggle a little bit with gardening in the fall, or you may have to move your planting dates up to earlier than what I'm going to suggest. Um, water is not as, uh, it's not as critical for fall gardening because the, the um, without the, you know, really hot days of the summertime, the soil just doesn't dry out as, as quickly. So if you don't have as readily a source of, of water, uh, hand, hand watering is much more of an option and, uh, and a lot of times you don't have to water at all. Okay, I'm gonna go back, uh, I'm gonna start crop by crop, and I'm gonna go back to one we already talked about. This is scallions, and if you remember in the first class, I, I planted from these little um, uh, one inch long uh, scallions, I cut off, cut off and used the rest of it, uh, and planted these in the ground. But now I'm gonna talk about, again, this is concentrating on pretty much from midsummer on. So when I wanna harvest some scallions, I have two options. One, I could pull the whole thing out of the ground, I can cut the root off just like I showed here and replant it, but it's much easier if you just leave it right in the ground. You haven't disturbed it at all and just cut off what you need. So this is, this is uh, you can see what's happening. It's sending out a new shoot. And if my, the dates are right, uh, correct on my, um, uh, um, what do you call it? on my photos, the little um, uh, scallion to the left, uh, left-hand side, bottom left-hand side of the page is is that same plant. It's it's 14 days later, so it's already starting to grow back again, and it's going to be a you know full scallion by the fall. Um, if you don't happen to harvest your scallions over the summertime, you didn't need any. Your your own onions are in. You're using those instead. Um, they get to be leek size um, by fall. This is actually taken in September. I uh, started harvesting them in October. That's my hand. Uh, so you can see how big they are. They are not leeks. Uh, they are scallions. Uh, you probably, they're too big to use on something like a salad, but what we do is we cut these up and use them just like we would regular onions. You can use the tops and the bottoms, um, really handy. Okay, carrots. Um, uh, carrots, <clears throat> for fall planting, I plant my carrots in June I try to plant them about a week before the new moon. Now, the reason I plant them a week before the new moon is um, the, there is more movement within us within the moisture in the soil when you get a, a new moon or new moon or full moon, but particularly the new moon. And and carrots are difficult to germinate. They take a long time. You plant lettuce and carrot seeds at the same time; they look almost identical. And the lettuce is out of the ground in about four or five days. Carrots can sometimes take two weeks. I have found that uh, it, it probably speeds up the germination. This is unscientific, but I, I think it speeds the germination up by four or five days if I can plant about a week before the new moon. Um, the other thing that I do, and I've mentioned these, this before, I, I use these row covers just to keep the soil a little bit more cool and moist in the, uh, in the summertime. Uh, again, I'll, I'll repeat myself, but, um, Johnny's selected seed had a special on these when they were open for seed. I think uh, Rich Skelly told us last, last week that Johnny's uh, is closed now to gardeners. They're just dealing with the farmers, but they open back up to gardeners, I believe, on April 28th. And whether or not they'll still have the special, this is Agrabond 19. 19 is some kind of a, uh, a weight. Uh, and it's the, uh, it's a, the smallest roll you can get is 50 feet. It's more than anyone would probably need in, in several seasons. Um, but if they have a special one, it's not too bad. Or, it's not too bad a deal. So basically, I'm planting my, um, my carrots. Uh, we talked about this in the first class. Just we, we, we did for lettuce and, uh, and carrot seeds. Little trench, make with my finger. I pour the seeds in. I, I tamp it just with my kind of, kind of shrub karate chopping perpendicular to the way the trench is going. So it buries some seed, some seed is still left on the surface. Um, that's fine. If I get some wet weather, the stuff that's on the surface will start to germinate and, and maybe do better. Some of, the, some of the ones that are buried will do better if it's dry. Um, okay, so, so um, 
there are a number of varieties of carrots. One, I, I, I like to get the storage carrots to plant in June because basically what I'm going to be doing is harvesting in November and December. And they produce some fairly large carrots, um, which I find I can use a large carrot for anything I can use a small carrot for. And uh, there have been years when I've actually calculated, I had one year I had 17 pounds of carrots and they're only 42 carrots. So you can see a lot of them were, were uh, probably half pounders um, and they don't get tough. Uh, Bolero, B-O-L-E-R-O -E is the one variety I've liked. I've used a lot and um, I recommend it. Uh, does anybody have any other specific varieties they like for, store, for uh, fall crops? You have to unmute yourself, I'll give you a second. Okay. Um, uh, okay, chard, we talked about chard the first class, but if you plant it in June, you usually get a decent crop by the fall. Um, and uh, the same family as beets. Uh, again, I, I, I go with that planting about a week before the full moon um, in June for beets. Um, I have, as of last year in the spring, I've started planting these inside in little um, trays like you saw earlier in the um, uh, second slide in the presentation. That was ones that I just planted today, but I'm doing it now for uh, my summer plantings because I seem to get a lot better germination. Um, uh, it, I think the beets, when they're this stage, uh, they seem to be really liked by birds because uh, I'll notice I've got a pretty good stand here. Uh, you can see the tiny beet seeds in uh, this one row, um, but they seem to get thinned out and I don't do the thinning. Uh, I don't know why beets seem to be popular with the birds, but they, they do seem to be. So that's why I'm starting to go into planting uh, in those little cells uh, in potting soil and then transplanting a clump. So if you, if you, I'll repeat myself from the first, from the first session, I plant about four seeds in each one of those cells, those two and a half by two and a half foot cells. And, and I just pick those up from, uh, you know, plants that I've purchased, maybe tomato seedlings or whatever, uh, and reuse them. Um, and then I'll thin them down to three or four beets per cell. And then I'll plant that whole clump about uh, a foot apart from the next clump. Um, and they'll grow as a clump and you can thin them uh, by, by harvesting. And when you do, it allows the remaining ones to grow bigger so you can keep harvesting all summer, all summer, uh, fall long, I guess. Um, okay, lettuce. Planting's the same way as carrots, but I succession plant lettuce, and we talked about this earlier, I succession plant lettuce starting in the spring, but I continue all summer long. Now, right here, you're seeing a succession of three plantings of carrots, each about two and a half, approximately two and a half um, weeks apart. The ones under the, the row cover, you're gonna see in a minute, but they're really small. And the ones in the back uh, on the middle are probably uh, you know, three and a half weeks old. And then the ones in the back are probably about five weeks old. They're about ready for, for harvesting. They're not quite uh, uh, as big as they could get, but I can certainly start to harvest those. I pull this row cover off and you'll see those seedlings are you know, maybe an inch, inch tall. Um, they're in kind of clusters. I've got some skips there, but uh, not too bad of a stand. But if you don't thin where you see all those, all those um, seedlings growing together, what happens is they get leggy. Uh, they'll compete with each other. They'll get, they'll get leggy and they won't produce a, a good crop and the crop can get kind of bitter. So <clears throat> at this stage, thin them out. It's kind of hard to thin, you know, you're killing a plant, but uh, you're doing it so you can, <laughs> you can actually get something out of it. Um, so let's see, this is um, the, the same area you see a little bit closer of the ones in the background, which are about five weeks old, the ones in the front, which are about two and a half weeks old. Uh, and again, those ones in the back can be harvested. And this is, um, okay, this is, uh, let's see, I think it's um, September 15th. So if I go back to the, oops, I go back to the, um, the, the three shots here. Um, the one that in the remay were planted August 30th. That's a little bit late. I, I now don't plant that late. I try to plant, I try to plant my last lettuce crop on about 
August 20th, between August 20th and 25th. Um, what that does is it allows the plants to get fairly large by the end of September, and they don't grow a lot after the end of September. They will during Indian summer, which we almost always have. Um, but they'll grow a little bit throughout the fall, and I, and I do a big planting at, on that date. Because if everything works out well, that's going to be lettuce for the whole fall. From basically maybe mid-October, I can start harvesting that, or maybe late October. And I've harvested as late as uh, as late December. I'll show you'll show you'll see some shots about from late December. Sorry, I'm, uh, babbling my words tonight. Sorry. Um, so again, three successions. Uh, October, I'm sorry, August 30th in the foreground, and in the middle there is um, uh, August 15th. So they're going to be pretty good size by the end of September. Whoops. Okay. Going the wrong way. Oops. Okay, so this is that same uh, the same planting dates. This was those, those these were those middle uh, uh, middle ones, I believe, that were, were planted on. Um, August 15th, and th this is um, late October. So these guys are, are ready to plant. Uh, these are the, the last ones planted, and this is um, just before Thanksgiving. Uh, so again, the, the heads are not huge. It was a pretty good fall. I, I, I said I don't like to plant as late as October, um, sorry, August 30th, but we did, and we got an okay crop. Um, okay. Uh, oh. Before I go on, um, there are some specific varieties I like to plant for summer crops for lettuce. And red salad bowl is the most common one. I find that it holds its flavor up in the summertime. Now, these plants may have been planted in the summertime, so they're, but they're going to be harvested in the fall. So I'll go with any variety then. I like to, I like to plant the loose leaves. Um, I use two varieties extensively, Tropicana and uh, Red Leaf, uh, Red Fire, I mean. Um, but other varieties are fine. But, okay, the three varieties I plant for the warm weather in the summertime are um, uh, Red Salad Bowl, uh, Magenta, and um, I'm sorry, uh, I can't think of the third one. <laughs> I'll, I'll think of it at some point and, and blur it in. Um, but if you, if you told, tried those two varieties, you'd, you'd be doing well. Okay, turnips. Um, uh, Daryl, I think I, I promised I'd talk about turnips again. Um, when I moved to New Jersey, an old timer who was a neighbor farmer said, you plant your turnips on August 8th. If you plant earlier than that, uh, you're going to have um, uh, maggot problems. If you plant later, they may not size up. Now, I found that I, I continue to plant around August 8th as, as much as possible. I plant right on August 8th, but I'm having more um, root maggot problems than I used to have. And I think it may be just because of the, the warming climate. Um, so what are, what are root maggots? Okay, uh, <clears throat> the, um, it's, it's a fly, I believe, and it lays its eggs near the base of the turnip plant and the eggs hatch and they burrow into the plant. Now this is gonna cause some damage to this turnip. If I was selling it, I might not be able to, but uh, it's not gonna ruin the turnip. Uh, they don't seem to be that extensive. They'll burrow in, they'll, I don't know what happens inside there, but they seem to eat their way in uh, and then they stop. Um, so you can basically cut out the bad spots. Now, let me talk a little bit about that as a pest. Um, this is probably uh, the turnip planted on August 8th. It's probably the end of, um, oh, I see some snow. So this is that, that year we had the um, October 30th snowstorm. Um, they're not going to lay their eggs uh, on, a, on a turnip that's this, this big. They're going to do it when, when they're smaller. Um, a friend who is uh, who used to be the um, entomologist for UMass, I, I asked about this one time, he said, um, Whatever, whatever this insect is, and I don't know what the adult is, um, it has five generations during a normal summer. And she said the last egg laying is around um, uh, Labor Day. So I, I've tried a garlic spray uh, on the base of the little seedlings. They're still fairly small by Labor Day. Uh, I think it may have helped a little bit. I don't know specifically. 
Another thing that, that actually farmers will do is they will spread diatomaceous earth. It's the same thing that's used in, in uh, swimming pool filters. I, I think it's a different grade. Um, a caution with that, I wouldn't do it without a mask uh, because uh, you don't want to breathe those particles in. Uh, they can be disruptive to, to lungs. So it, for that reason, I've, I've always been afraid to use it. Uh, I usually just deal with having to cut out a little bit of the, of the damaged turnip. Um, but I, I have tried also that, that garlic spray. Um, it's not something I typically have in my, my arsenals of, of uh, whatever. But. Okay, uh, so again, back to brass, the whole brassica family. Um, in the springtime, I will buy seedlings. Uh, some of you guys are growing. I've, I've seen tomatoes uh, growing inside. I don't do that. I just don't have good enough um, space for it. So I go out and buy my seedlings. But in the summertime, you can't buy brassica seedlings because nobody thinks about planting them. So I will start brassicas, which is, okay, I'm talking about broccoli, cabbage, kale. You can do it with cauliflower. I think cauliflower takes a little bit longer season. So I haven't had as much luck and I've stopped, I've actually stopped this system with that. Brussels sprouts uh, are not gonna work very well. You would have to have planted those a, a, a month before I plant mine. So what is my planting scheme? I take some of my potting soil and I fill it up and I plant seeds on July 1st. I used to say July 4th, but I, I have had a couple of years where I've had trouble getting broccoli heads to size and just a few days in the summertime makes a big difference in the fall. So, and I happen to have a, a south facing uh, stairs. Uh, and if, if I hear the thunderstorm is on away or something like that or hailstorm, um, then I just put them under the cover and they get pretty good sunlight even under cover. So they're, they're quite well protected there. I can keep an eye on them. And uh, it's probably the only option because I don't think garden supplies, uh, garden centers have these brassicas in the summertime. A uh, little bit closer look. Um, uh, you see a few holes in the leaves. Now your, your um, pests will attack while they're in the, um, uh, still in these cells. So we talked a little bit about um, some of the pests. I guess I'll talk about that later. I, I do have a little session on, i um, gonna get back into some of the pests on fall crops. Um, basically, I just plant them out. Uh, this would be late, late July. Uh, usually about four weeks in those, in those cells is, is fine. Uh, I have kept them back uh, some, sometimes until August and depends, that's a little late. I've had some falls that they've done okay. In. And basically just, uh, again, transplant them in holes. Um, uh, this bed was, I don't remember, I, I, I now actually use a system where um, my onion crop, uh, I have onions in three rows in one of these beds. And the onion crop sometimes is out by the end of July and sometimes not, but it doesn't matter because I plant two parallel rows of brassicas so I can plant them when the onion crop is still in. By that time, the end of July, the onion crop is pretty much done growing and the tops are starting to die back. So they're very compatible, even though they can overlap by a, by a week or two. Okay, so here's the pest I was talking about. Uh, it's, it's one of the cabbage worms. There are several varieties. This one's the imported, uh, I believe it's called the imported cabbage worm. You'll see these, uh, they'll be all over the garden if you're growing brassicas. Um, in the summertime, you know, basically all season long. Um, that's what its worm looks like. There's several related varieties imported. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a cabbage looper and there's another one I forget the name of, but they all are susceptible to Bacillus surgiensis BT, which we talked about during the pest uh, session um, last week, I think it was. Okay, here's a, here's a pest we didn't talk about. And we didn't talk about it because it seems to be mainly a problem in the, in the fall. In the fall, uh, you're, you get dew on the crops, you get dew on the ground, and these guys will crawl all around. They won't do that in the hot, dry summertime. Um, where they hide is probably in the grass, and they will come in from any grassy area. Uh, and you can see they actually eat the leaves. Um, this happens to be lettuce, but they particularly go after lettuce and brassicas. Um, and they, they will, they're indiscriminate. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of suggestions I'm gonna have. Uh, 
turtles. Uh, we have a number of box turtles around us, and sometimes I find them parked right next to the garden fence. What are they doing there? Well, um, slugs and snails are listed as one of their three favorite foods. Um, and so I'm pretty sure they're picking off slugs and they're going back and forth from the cultivated garden uh, in the lawn, where they probably spend a lot of their nights. Now, I have some areas that are mulch. They probably spend time under the, the still overnight under those the mulch too. But um, it's, it's uh, you know, if you see these things around, encourage them. Um, uh, they're our friend. Um, I, a pest control that I maybe mentioned briefly last week, but I didn't get into, go into detail because, again, it's mainly for slugs. It's called Sluggo. It's made out of some kind of mineral ferric phosphate, I think it is. Uh, so it is, that actually is allowed for organic um, production. And I usually just sprinkle it around um, the whole bed of brassicas and lettuce and greens or whatever in the fall. And you know, eventually the, it'll kind of disappear. The rain will wash it into the soil. And so I may reapply a couple of times, but it, it really has been effective. Um, I used to just go out and hand pick, which I'll get into a minute. Um, and I, I used to go out and sometimes pick 50, 60 slugs off of my brassica bed, maybe even more uh, and at night. You, you will not find slugs during the daytime. Possibly you will if we had a long extended wet spell, but you'll find them if you go out at night. So basically, uh, this is kind of backwards. Let me, actually, let me go on. So a good headlamp, examine the leaves, uh, and basically I take a popsicle stick or a, or a um, plant marker and just uh, brush them off into a jar full of white vinegar. Um, they seem to die almost immediately. Uh, and this jar fills up pretty quickly. Um, but again, if, if you try to sluggle, the sluggle will eliminate a lot of the need for this. Um, if you only have a few plants, um, go ahead and, and keep up with them. You know, you may get a few holes if you're if you, um, doing it by hand, holes on the leaves. But if you're not selling it, I don't think there's a big problem with that. Um, the other, uh, another effective, fairly effective um, method is what I call a sl uh, slug saloon. On the resource um, guide, everybody received. I hope Nagisa did it. Uh, folks that signed up today for the first time, did they get that yeah, resource I, guide? I did send it out to everybody. Great. Okay. Yeah, on the last two pages, I have a bunch of um, resources. Um, and I, this is from Peaceful Valley. Um, that's the top on the, on the top of the, the slide is actually the top. It goes on the top of the bottom, but basically you, you fill the bottom up. They'll, they will um, send you a, a mix of basically the mix is, is, is yeast. Um, you can also use beer in there because it's basically the, the, um, the yeast they're after in the beer. I, I find that actually Belgium works better. I think it's a stronger yeast. Uh, uh, Belgian beer seems to work better than regular beer. Uh, or, you know, hoppy beer is a little bitter, but they're attracted to the yeast and they'll go in that and um, basically they drown. They go in uh, head first and they actually just, you know, they drown themselves. Um, so a couple of things, I, I generally find that I don't get a lot, you know, I'll get maybe three or four slugs a night. So it's, it's one tool amongst others, but slugs do not like, um, copper. I, I, there's some kind of a reaction um, with the, the slime that they give off, and I don't remember what it is. But uh, So I have a couple of pieces of copper tube. I actually make a V facing the, the, um, the, the grass where I think they're coming in from, and hopefully that leads a, a few more to the, um, uh, the slug trap. Okay, I wanted to find out a little bit more about slugs because they seem to, to last through the, the um, uh, be problem right through the winter time. A lot of times we get early cold days in the in the fall. So I, I didn't know how slugs will overwintering. They will overwinter by burrowing under um, mulch. So this is a December, uh, early December day where we, we had a nice sunny day. Uh, actually, it's the day after. Um, so I raked up some mulch and I found some slugs. I put them on a, at the very end of the day. So uh, you know those those nice sunny winter days that it's really you know it's not too cold during the day but then all of a sudden it gets really cold at night. So this is one of those days. The end of the day, I I put a couple of slugs on my picnic bench on a white piece of paper, and this is what it looked like the next morning. 
So I wasn't sure if this thing could come back, if this would, would revive itself. Uh, but a day later, it started to turn black. So basically, it killed them. So uh, I talked about using a lot of leaves um, on the second class for, for fertility. And one of the ways I store them is in pathways, which allows me to walk in those pathways. So now when I find one of those early uh, cold days coming on, uh, or clear days in the, in the wintertime, when I know it's, oh, it's not, too, not too cold in the daytime, but it's going to get really cold at night, I will rake some of those leaves into piles so it exposes some of the, the soil where those slugs were staying. And if I time this right, I'm pretty sure I'm freezing out a lot of them. So it's going to reduce my, um, you know, the, the resurgence of those pests in the, in the spring. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my brassicas now. Um, this is uh, this is my brassica bed on um, the, the end of um, the end of August. You see in the front there; those are my turnips. They need to be thin. Uh, those are the ones I probably planted on August eighth. And those uh, seedlings in the background are um, broccoli, kale, uh, cabbage that I transplanted around the end of July. They've, had, they've been in the ground for about a month and they're starting to take off, uh, doing quite well. Um, this is actually the end of September. Uh, again, uh, that's broccoli right in the front. It's not big enough to harvest yet. Can't even see the head, but the heads will come out and they're, they're doing quite well. Uh, and then this is actually the middle of October. The turnips are in the front. Um, don't remember if this is the same bed the same year, um, but certainly the same planting scheme. And, and those um, other brassicas are in the back uh, and they are starting to produce. And this is, the again, the same planting scheme. This is broccoli on October 18th. So that's a nice head of broccoli um, using this planting scheme. Um, you know, broccoli tends to come in about uh, all at the same time, whereas uh, things like kale, you can just keep picking the leaves. Um, and, and cabbage, I leave in for a while because I want to get as big a head as possible. So this is um, six kale plants uh, planted, again, with the scheme, seeds on, on uh, July 1st, transplant out late July. Uh, and, and this is uh, mid-November. So there's an awful lot of kale out there right now uh, at, at this point. And those could be harvested and, and they will overwinter. This was probably um, one of the best years I, I had, um, this year being probably equal to it. I don't get the same every year. Now, one thing about kale is um, it keeps growing. Uh, as you see, it gets big. You see some, some yellow leaves out on the lower left-hand side, uh, a little bit closer shot, whoops, closer shot right here. Um, it's not your plant, your plant's not dying, but as the kale plant grows, it's putting its energy into growing new, new leaves. So if you, don't, if you don't keep up with picking the, the leaves, they'll turn yellow like this and they become useless. So two ways I've tried to get around that, uh, because I don't use a lot of kale while the, you know, the broccoli and the lettuce is coming in. Uh, I, I view it more as a really cold crop, as a winter crop. So, but I do keep picking the, I try now to keep picking these leaves before they turn yellow and basically chopping them up, maybe parboiling them and putting them in the freezer and using them for, for stews. Um, I'll also, you know, make vegetable stews in the, in the fall out of things like this. I, I, every year I make a couple of huge pots of borscht and borscht is generally made with beets and cabbage as the main ingredients, but rather than cabbage, I use kale and it seems to be you know, perfectly fine. And then I put those in the freezer. That's my way of preserving vegetables that I can have. Uh, we still have a bowl, a, a bowl of a borscht in our freezer right now. We haven't used it all up. Um, okay, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm talking about planting still and um, spinach, uh, I try to plant that uh, by about the 1st of September. And I think um, it might've been you, uh, Lynn, uh, we're talking about your scheme for planting um, uh, spinach. I planted about the 1st of September and it usually does not, I can probably harvest some of it in, in, the, in the fall, but basically what I'm trying to do is um, get it to a size where I can harvest it the next spring, it's, it, my early crops. And I don't do this every year because I find it doesn't come in that much earlier than my lettuce, uh, spring planted lettuce. Um, uh, <clears throat> Lynn, was it you that, um, that, 
that does some some spinach too, or, or if it wasn't you, somebody want to make a comment about your planting scheme for spinach? It wasn't me. Okay. Could you just tell me again, though, the dates with that kale? You, you yeah. Uh, you mean the the uh, the, the planting? Three dates. Yeah. Okay. Plant your seeds in pots or in in, in a flat or whatever on uh, July first. Okay. Transplant them out about four weeks later when they're when they're ready. Okay. Uh, and then um, you could start harvesting them. I, you know, probably in October. But I, I generally, we generally don't eat kale until kale. Come back up. Kale actually improves the the, the flavor vastly improves after after it's had some really hard frost. Mm. So it's not our priority for eating in October. Um, but if I don't pick those lower leaves, I'm basically wasting them. So I, I, again, I, I, I pick them and then uh, put them in the put them in the freezer or make a soup. Thanks. Okay, garlic is probably the last thing um, ar around here. Planting is recommended for uh, October 30th, uh, but of course it's you're planting in the fall for uh, uh, next uh, July harvest. Um, this is basically that garlic um, planted uh, around October 20th. Uh, I've planted it as late as, as mid, uh, not mid, but early November and still getting a decent crop. Um, but it uh, depends upon the fall. And again, that one, maybe one of those things you can plant a little bit later if our climate's changing. Um, okay, so I think I talked about, har uh, about planting all those things. Now I'm going to talk about late harvesting and post-harvest handling. Okay, so basically uh, trying to stretch that harvest as late as you can into the fall when it gets cold. Um, <clears throat> these are scallions. Uh, I showed you that what the scallions look like in October. Now they will last into December, but there's a certain point where they start to, the, the outer, outer leaves, I guess, will start to die off. And these probably would have been a lot more productive if they were planted, I'm sorry, harvested about Two or three weeks earlier. This actually is around Christmas time, uh, and sometimes you can get away with, with leaving them in the ground that long. But um, if you have planted onions and you're you're using them, I would suggest cutting off your use of onions, uh, bulb onions, around you know early early December, and then just trying to use these guys as you would bulb onions for you know a couple of weeks until they're gone. Uh, yeah, again, this is a little bit. This is actually after same. I'm sorry, this is not after December. This is like December 18th or something like that. This is three days later when that snow had melted, but they look even worse. So just a, another illustration of how they, they can get, uh, they'll, they'll just go bad. Now, I harvested these and got some use out of them, but it would have been better a few, few weeks ago. Okay, I wanna, <clears throat> um, I'm using the ground as storage as long as I can. And crops like carrots and turnips will keep growing right into the, you know, to the cold of, of fall. This is actually the day after Christmas, and those are all harvested that day. Uh, not every fall is like that. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of some, some falls that we had that were, were, quite, were quite bad. Not bad, but were, were colder. And uh, <clears throat> so these guys are all going into the basement, and I'll show you where I store them. Um, uh, if I didn't have room in the basement, I mean, they're, they're still perfectly well in the refrigerator, but they do need to keep to stay cold. Um, I do not have a, I have a basement, but I don't have a walkout basement. It's um, meaning that you know, your uh, level, your basement floor is on the same level as your backyard, which may slope down a hill. So this is, these are steps going outside. And I found that I can keep them in this area. It may get a little bit below freezing, but I I'll show you a little better. Uh, I put them in perforated bags and I lay some, uh, some burlap or old sheets, uh, not sheets, old blankets or something um, on the bottom and then I cover them with, with additional blankets, uh, burlap. Those burlap bags are just from a, a, co a local coffee roaster. Uh, and I can, I can keep them here until, really until the outside gets, starts to get warm um, in like late March. Depends, you know, sometimes early March is warm. Uh, often, often until late March. They sometimes sprout a little bit. The carrots and the turnips may start to sprout a little bit, but it doesn't seem to 
uh, you know, affect them that much. Um, one thing I think is helpful, this is where those stairs lead up to. And if you can um, keep it covered with snow, it just helps to insulate a little bit because uh, cold wind will, will um, work its way in there. But I have never lost anything in that storage situation. Um, if you don't have something like that or you want to try something different, uh, they can actually be stored outside. Now, this is a, a heavy duty piece of plastic, happens to be one uh, that I got at a dairy farm, which uh, I think it's called silage wrap, uh, black on one side, white on the other side. Um, and there's leaves underneath. Okay, pull it back, you can see the leaves. I've tried storing carrots in the ground under just leaves. And what, what I find is that, uh, when it's a really wet winter, those leaves get soaking wet and the ground gets soaking wet. And then the whole ground can freeze, including you know, the, the leaves and the ground, and it can ruin the tops of the carrots. When it's dry, when those carrot tops are dry, you don't get that problem. So that's why I started using this, um, you know, basically just a piece of plastic. It's been on all winter long. Um, this was mid-March, I pulled that back rake back the leaves and underneath you could see the tiny carrots, uh, carrot tops starting to sprout again. They're actually doing that under the mulch. Uh, it's starting to turn warm and basically, um, you know, just dig them up and, uh, you know, you haven't had to refrigerate them or store them all winter long. Um, lettuce. Uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes we, we're harvesting lettuce right up until um, New Year's. But there have been some times where I've run into problems. Um, the, um, the fall of 2014, we had really warm weather, extremely warm weather up till early November, and then it turned extremely cold. And what I found is the lettuce did not have a chance to really harden off. You've heard that term before. Um, and I had a really nice crop this year. Uh, but what I had was a lot of damage, uh, and, and it's, you know, generally lettuce can take a lot of, of frost, and I will cover it sometimes um, uh, on really cold days and maybe November or December, but generally I don't even do that. And uh, there were two of us, uh, and another a friend of ours, Stephanie Harris, who grows lettuce also, and she was covering hers last, last December, and I wasn't just to see who would do better, and mine did fine. Um, so, but what, what can happen is if you don't get those cold, cold nights in the earlier part of the fall, it just, it, uh, it, it, it can affect it uh, negatively. Uh, a couple more shots. So this is actually a, a different year. And uh, again, a, a, a flannel blanket over the, um, the lettuce patch. This was, I think, December 15th. Uh, this is the next day I pulled it off, a little light, nice warmer day, and it's nice lettuce under here. So I, I do occasionally use cover like that. Uh, I find a flannel sheet, as long as it doesn't get wet, it works fine. Um, just doing it temporarily, but I've, I've gone a lot of times without covering lettuce in the, in the um, fall, and as long as it seems to have a chance to harden off, it does, does fine. Uh, this is one of those heads, it's not particularly large. Uh, I think this is a year I planted the um, uh, the last lettuce on, uh, uh, sorry, August 30th. So some of those heads did not get very large, but they're still, you know, edible lettuce there. So let me go back to 2014, which is our, our problem year. Um, maybe 13, I think it was 14, but. Um, so this is early December. Uh, turned extremely cold. And I, those shots you saw of those lettuce leaves that had, had died or were dying, was this same crop, same year, but it was before the snow came. So it, it went from bad to worse. Um, so about uh, December 18th, I was able to, enough snow had melted, I was able to pull back and it looks pretty, pretty sad under there. But three days later, oh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, uh, yeah, this is harvested, actually, let me, let me go one more photo. Uh, three days later, that, that stuff that all looked mashed was starting to pop back. And those, those um, shots you saw were actually ha harvested in, my, in our kitchen. So it didn't look that bad. And again, this is uh, the week before Christmas. So uh, there was some browning of uh, what I call the midriff, which um, you, know, you see that a lot of times you'll see that in romaine lettuce, even during the summertime. So basically, I just cut up the midriff and, and the rest of it was fine. Um, 
and cilantro, I always plant, I often plant cilantro at the same time I plant lettuce. And again, this was December 18th. Um, three days later, the snow had melted and there's, there's green and there's brown cilantro in there. So basically we could pick it. We had to pick out the brown, brown although maybe even that was edible. Um, and there's, there was plenty of good, uh, good food. Now cabbage, uh, another member of the brassica family. Um, if you look in the middle of this cabbage uh, section, uh, cross section, um, right in the middle is what I call the growing point. Cabbage can take an awful lot of frost. Uh, it's kind of rubbery if you, you know, you've all dealt with cabbage before and the leaves are kind of rubbery. And I think that's what allows it to expand and contract with, um, with frost. Uh, you know, the, the um, frozen, freezing doesn't bother me because it has that expansion. Ability. But if the, if the frost gets into that growing point, uh, it's going to kill the plant and it'll rot from the inside out. So I try to leave my cabbage out as long as I can, but if I look on the weather re report and I see that it's going to be below freezing for about three days in a row, then I'm, I'm afraid that frost will get into that growing point and that's when it's time to harvest. Um, most years that's not until mid, maybe mid, um, mid December, sometimes even a little bit later, but that 2014 year, I actually lost some cabbage because I kept it in too long. And I should have had it out early December. Um, when you harvest, um, don't forget all these lower leaves. You, you, I'm taking out the head for storage, but uh, these are not pretty. There's probably some slug holes in them, uh, but I can cut those slug holes out and I can use them for soups. Uh, yeah, again, I'm trying to make the most of it. So I'm going to talk for a while about kale, my favorite plant. This kale plant is 16 months old. It's mid-November, and it was planted a year before in early July as a seedling in a pot. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see, it's come through It's come through a winter, it's come through a summer, and it's going back into the, uh, the fall again, and there's still a lot of food out there. That's one kale plant. Even on the right-hand side, you see it drooping down. It's a, uh, um, a branch drooping down. Now, sometimes when I overwinter kale, I get aphid problems. Um, it doesn't happen very often, and luckily it hasn't happened in, in four or five years. Um, but I, and I don't know why it, it happened some years. I thought my balance of predators, you know, ladybugs, whatever, was, was pretty good. But I have had it happen. This can be sprayed with safer soap. Safer soap will um, desiccate. Uh, it'll dry out the, I don't know, I guess it desiccates the, the aphid body. Uh, it causes it to dry out. Uh, but the aphids will die right in place. So you need to come uh, follow it by a day or two uh, with just a, a, a garden hose spray or even a, a strong sprayer, which will actually knock the aphids off the plant. Now, you may not have killed them all, but generally if you can knock back 90% of them, then um, the predators seem to take care of the rest and I haven't had a problem after that. Um, okay. I'm going to go back to that year of 2014 when we had the, the uh, worst year. It, and it did affect the ability to overwinter. Now, the, there's two years I've had problems with overwintering kale. Uh, the first one was a year, I guess there were no acorns because the squirrels seem to just eat all the kale uh, one winter. Um, and it's only happened once. Although I know there's years when acorns are better than, uh, than others. Um, and, and then this is 2014, we had that really uh, on, quick onset of cold weather. Um, this is um, just before Christmas, uh, about December 20th, and the kale all looks fairly healthy. The other three varieties, one on the, on the left is, I think you call it Italian. Um, I think there's several names for it. Um, and then on the right, it's a, it's a curly kale. There's several varieties. I like the variety called winter boar. Um, and then in the front is uh, the red Russian kale. Um, so I wanted to compare. Um, so again, this is the Italian kale. It looks fairly healthy, although some of the leaves are dying back. Um, uh, the Russian kale, uh, it, it got kind of compacted by the snow, but otherwise there's edible stuff there. And then the winter boar is upright and it seems to be the most healthy looking. Now, uh, just like on the cabbage, the kale plant has a growing point. And it's 
in the kale plant, it's the very top of the plant. And if you look in here, this is that at the, the Italian kale, and that growing point is brown. It means that this kale did not make it through that cold snap. Again, it's only happened once, uh, but it's something you want to look out for. The same with the Russian kale, the red Russian kale. Um, it didn't make it through. The, that growing point is dead. So the leaves can be harvested, but it's not going to produce much. Now the winter boar, the, the, the curly kale, um, I, I did see that in a couple of plants, but there are a couple of plants that, that did not seem to be um, affected that same way. So the reason I'm showing you this is if you want to try to um, create a, a kale patch that's going to produce uh, you know, food for you the next spring, um, I, I now recommend going with the, the curly leaf varieties. Uh, winter boar again is my favorite, but there are probably other ones out there that are that are good too. Um, so basically, this is what that patch looked like. The ones in the, uh, I'm sorry, look like the next March, and I'll I'll show you a comparison to other marches. Those in the front are all the Italian kales. Um, you can't really see the Russian kales; they're kind of on the ground. In the back, there are actually two winter boars, which don't look as healthy as they usually do in March, but they're they're still alive. Uh, yeah, again, I, I think that's the um, a little different view. The winter boar, it's probably a week or two later, it's starting to grow back again. Um, but one thing I did notice is on those Italian kales, they started to produce new sprouts at the base. Now that would be okay um, if I wanted to let them grow that long, but usually I, I, make, uh, I take these guys out in um, late spring, mid to late spring to make room for, for new crops. Um, uh, okay, this is uh, again that year that I had problems with the uh, squirrels and for some reason they didn't, uh, they seemed to like the winter board more than like the, the Russian kale. So that Russian kale, uh, you know, it has the advantages in the other time, but uh, out of the, I don't know, maybe tw uh, <clears throat> 15 years of, that I've been on this site, I've done this every year and there's only two that have had, had problems over wintering and you've seen examples of both. Um, this is a year, uh, actually it was 2018, 17, I believe, um, when we had really warm, um, really warm February and in uh, March turned really cold. So I did get some more damage there. Uh, you know, basically this kale plant looked fine in January. It was producing, you know, new leaves. Those are edible leaves, the green ones, but the, but it seems to have died in the middle. All the, the new growth was not, um, yeah, it, it, it basically killed the plant. So again, it was the third year I had a little bit of a problem. And uh, it, it is starting to produce some new, newer leaves, but they were, uh, you know, kind of look like this. There's some good in that leaf, some damage. So there's edible parts in that if you, if you really need some, some greens early in the season. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 but uh, that, um, uh, we call it the Italian kale, just, yeah, it, it, it didn't do well at all. Okay, so again, the kale can be harvested all winter long. We, we, uh, it doesn't grow much in the winter, so a lot of times I'll leave uh, growth on it. Uh, it tastes great this time of year. Another Groundhog Day, um, it, it's really sweet. Uh, you know, it's great. Okay, so a, a typical, I would say this is probably one of the better falls I've had. Um, this is uh, about March 10th. So there's a lot of, this is not this March 10th. I think I, saw, I showed you a picture earlier of what um, uh, this April looked like. But this, again, you can harvest those leaves. They can, um, uh, they're, they're edible. They're still sweet this time of year. Um, and then the plant will kind of start to change. This is about the first of, of April. Um, and it will, it will continue to grow, continue to put out leaves at the top and at the bottom, it starts to put out new leaves. A new shoots. But what happens is it turns, um, it, 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 its tendency is to put out, uh, or to reproduce. So it starts to put out these little broccoli-like florets. And these are really good. Um, this is one plant. Uh, they need to be harvested about every three days because if they turn yellow and go to seed, they become bitter. Uh, although there's nothing wrong with a little bit of bitterness in your diet. Um, but uh, you know, basically, this is three days worth of um, floret harvest from um, six plants. Uh, and, you know, every three days we get in there uh, and harvest. Um, 
uh, again, this is a little bit later in the spring, though, that, that kale, um, the um, Italian kale I showed you that started to sprout at the very bottom, it thought it had died, but it, it did actually produce some leaves later in the fall. Um, okay, there's a certain time of year. Uh, actually, it's not a certain time of year. Um, if I want to keep those kale plants in the ground, they're going to stop producing those florets at the summer solstice. Uh, they know when the light starts to get, uh, you know, the days start to get shorter. And they will stop producing those florets, but then go back to producing leaves. So uh, most of the time now, I will pull these out of the ground to make room for, you know, something else that's coming in between uh, later. But, but again, the vegetative harvest can happen all year long. Uh, it's kind of a, uh, not a great photo because it's mixing the kale plant up with the tree in the background, but they get, they can get huge. Um, and what I would do at this stage, this is um, early July, and what I, what I should have done, I should say, is cut that back to about one foot. And if, if I want to take this through the summer into a second year, and then it'll start producing these shoots, which will produce nice, uh, you know, nice kale plants. It'll produce four or five of these per plant, and it'll look like you'll have four or five kale plants, which you, the photo you saw on my wife earlier was that, that exact same scenario. Uh, one plant, but it looked like it was about four or five of them. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, here, here's an example again. Um, I think that's the, uh, okay. So let's, um, hit me with questions. And what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm going to pull up what I call the fruit primer, small fruit primer. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not the world's expert on fruit. Um, but I do grow enough that I can give you some some tips, particularly on the the three that I uh, I concentrate on, which is blueberries, uh, fall raspberries, and strawberries. But um, before we get going, I think it's for the first time I haven't run over, but I still do have a little bit more to, to cover. Um, but does anybody have any any questions on the you know the gardening into the fall aspect? No, I have. Oh, sorry. Sure, go ahead. Um, Al, I have a question for you. It's Jean. Yeah. Um, on on the so on the kale on the kale. Excuse me. When you cut that down, you you cut off that growth point. It just takes off anyway, and it'll just divide out and. Be yeah, fine. I'm talking about cutting it um, after the florets uh, have been have really stopped growing, which is about the end of you know middle to end of June. Okay. Um, and 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 I don't cut it to the ground because on, on the first. Um, foot or so of the stem that will have started to produce new new uh, branches mm -hmm. and so those are the branches that are going to take off and um, produce that you know it looks like four or five kale plants but it's really just one kale plant with four or five shoots that have actually you know actually the, the equivalent of, of four other plants does that answer your question yes thanks thank mm -hmm. you yep i have a question sure. um okay uh this is adaro Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions, actually. One, could you do with collards what you do with kale and overwinter it? And if so, and if you've tried it, which varieties work best for you? Yeah, that's a good question, Daryl. Uh, I don't grow collards only because I've had such luck with kale. Um, I, I've heard that they'll overwinter fairly well, but I think they may be a little bit more like the, the, the um, uh, Italian kale. Uh, have, have you or does anybody else on this call have experience overwintering collards? I don't have experience overwintering collards. I was just wondering if the same thing could be done for collards because I eat a lot of those. Yeah, you know, the reason I, I haven't focused in on collards is because I consider collards to be a, uh, a southern crop, so I thought it was more warm weather. So because I've had, you know, I've had luck with kale, I've just never tried it. Um, okay. um, and then my second question has to do with turnips. Is there a way like, have you ever tried doing with turnips what you do with carrots and storing them in the ground? Um, I've tried unsuccessfully, but I tried unsuccessfully before I had the technique of actually covering the bed with, um, with leaves. So I don't know if it would work if you, co I'm sorry, um, covering the bed with plastic, covering the, the, the mulch with plastic. Uh, I'm not sure. I think they're more susceptible to, to freezing than our carrots, uh, but I actually haven't tried it. 
Okay. Uh, I haven't tried it successfully, let's put it that way. I've tried it unsuccessfully. Um, but, uh, but I've also harvested turnips in January, uh, early January, but, and, and I don't remember what the fall was like, but I, I, I know I've definitely harvested some that were, were still edible. Okay. Could you do, do you harvest the leaves in January or no? No, you know, by January, the leaves are not in very good shape. So if you want to harvest the, the leaves, the, um, uh, you know, probably have to do that in October, November, maybe into December. But I find even December, when, when I harvest for storage, I do harvest the whole plant and I cut off the leaves and I have to, I find that I only get about maybe a third of what I would have gotten it for leaf production if I had harvested them a month or two before. So the okay. quality of the leaves really goes down in the, in the quantity too. And they're there, but they're just, they're brown. <laughs> Thank can you. I, can I can I touch on can I address her question about the collards? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I have been growing collards for quite some time, mostly in Michigan. Um, last year was my first year growing them here in Jersey, um, and a lot of them got eaten by critters um, that some of which I wasn't used to. But in terms of overwintering them, what I have found is that they do bear up quite well um, in the winter. But I actually use a little plastic um, greenhouse that I throw on top. I, it's originally from Frame It All. I've been using it for a long time. And I just throw that little plastic greenhouse on top and it actually helps to keep them quite a bit longer um, throughout the winter. Um, I tend to eat them, so I've never tried to overwinter them the entire winter, but they do last quite considerably longer um, as it gets really, really cold. Uh, I throw that greenhouse over and it tends to keep them quite a bit longer. Thanks. Thank you so much. For what it's worth. <laughs> My Thank you so much. The plastic is You're both keeping them a little warm and keeping them dry. I think the dry helps them. Right. You know, helps them preserve them too. There's plenty of moisture in the soil by, you know, by winter time. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. I, I guess I may not still... <laughs> And quite in time, but we're getting close. Okay, so I'm, again, I call this small fruit primer. I'm not the world's expert on, on, on fruit, but I'll give you a couple of tips on how, uh, if you're thinking about getting started. Um, and uh, again, you can, you can email uh, questions to me at, um, at NOFA. Uh, and the geese will, will forward them to me if anybody has any questions. Okay, I'm gonna talk about uh, strawberries. And um, okay, so I order, I order plants from Nurse, or um, I, sometimes I get plants from Starks. Starks is another seed catalog, but Nurse, uh, they're not your typically known seed catalog like Starks is, um, but it's company in Massachusetts. You can Google them, and I'm, I'm pretty sure they're on your resource, um, it's page seven or eight of your resource guide. Um, I don't have actually have a picture, a good picture of the planting, uh, mainly because I've gone to a permanent bed now, which just worked out quite well. But you want to plant strawberries in an area where you don't have a weed problem. If you've got a former weed problem, uh, you're going to run into problems with strawberries because the strawberries will fill in and then you're going to end up having to hand, hand weed, which is a, a, a big chore. So uh, if I have the opportunity, I'll put them in an area where I may have had uh, crop, uh, uh, cover crop of buckwheat the previous year, which uh, really knocks back the weed population or another crop where I was able to cultivate it really well and keep the weeds in line. So I have 30, uh, three and a half foot wide beds and I plant plants every, I plant two rows in that bed, um, plants about two foot, two foot apart. And then uh, the, um, the other row, I stagger the plants. So it's, they're forming like triangles. Um, and uh, again, every two foot, Two, two foot apart in all directions. And what I'm trying to do is get them to fill in. So strawberry plants, um, you say, well, that's not very many plants, uh, two and a half feet apart, but each, what we call a mother plant, which you planted, will send out runners and the runners will fill in those spaces. Uh, generally, your first, you're not gonna get a crop the first year. As a matter of fact, if you see those mother plants starting to produce uh, flowers, you wanna pick them up because you want that energy to go into the daughter plants. So this, I believe, would probably be the, um, the year after planting. Um, as you see, those, um, those mother plants that put out the runners and they fill in the spaces really nicely. Um, so uh, to back up from that spring of the second year, so basically, I'm, I'm sorry, planting, the, planting would be early spring. 
um, you know, if you get them in mid-spring, it's okay, but I would go as early in spring as you can. The problem uh, you will run, run into over the winter time is not the cold, um, but it's the frost even. We talked about uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, I think. Um, and this is a perfect opportunity. I go around my neighborhood, I collect everybody's Christmas trees, I cut off the branches, and I cover the whole strawberry bed with um, Christmas tree boughs. So basically it's, yeah, it's keeping the, the leaves a little bit warm, but, but basically it's stopping the ground from frost heaving. I like to leave these on as long as I can. Uh, and one of the reasons I do is I want to hold back my berry production. If you're a commercial grower, if you're thinking about farming, which I know some of you are on this call, um, you may want to get those berries as soon as possible, but I'm not really concerned about soon. Uh, I want to hold back. And the reason I want to hold back is, uh, okay, I'll tell you in a minute. Basically, this is after I pulled off those, uh, whoops, uh, after I pulled off the um, boughs, yeah, they look a little small, and they are, but this is still early spring, so they'll start to take off. Uh, <clears throat> oops. Uh, and, you know, eventually start to produce fruit. So, uh, yes, go ahead. The slides aren't advancing. Yes, Al. Ah. I wonder why that is. Oh, yeah, we're just saying feeling the chill. Ah, I'm sorry. You know right. what? I think oh, did I forget to share my screen. Uh, let me stop share and then go back to share again. Okay. Thank you. Um, oops. Are you still on the first slide? Yeah. Ah. Okay. <laughs> share screen. Okay. Speaker view. It's getting speaker view now. Okay. Yeah. But not the not the screen. Okay. I'll try this. Oops. There it goes. Okay. So you see that bird, Richard? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, let me. I'm going to go back real quickly. Uh, yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Here we go. Um, okay. Again, spring, Christmas trees. I leave them on as long as I can. Uh, take them off. This is what they look like. They're, they're kind of small inside. They'll, they'll, even though they may have been bring, big in the fall, they'll, they'll reduce in size over the winter. Um, but my fruit, I want to hold back in my own gardening situation. I want to hold back because um, when you see those blossoms, uh, any frost of 30, less than 32 degrees will kill those blossoms and basically it's going to stop that blossom from producing a fruit. So that's why I want to hold back. Um, and, um, so my strawberries right now started blossoming two days ago. And, and most, many of you know, the last two nights we, brought, we had frost or at least had close to frost. So I had to cover my strawberries. If I didn't, I was going to lose my early fruit. They're probably only like 40 or 50 blossoms out there right now, but that's, you know, three or four quarts of strawberries and I don't want to lose those. Um, so there are some problems. One of them is, is um, cat, two main problems are catbirds and squirrels. Um, neither of these will fit through an inch mesh on a screen. So I've tried several methods. Uh, I, I get this one inch mesh screen and I, I, I attached it to pipes on either side, draped it over the garden, uh, but it was almost impossible to harvest this. It was just really difficult. So don't go that way. Um, but I did find out from this that, that, that the catbirds or the squirrels won't go through that one inch mesh. It doesn't matter if it's square or if it's round like in chicken fancy. So I've gone into another system. Um, these are four by six panels. Two of them are hinged together. Um, and I form a, a triangle over the, um, uh, the strawberries. Um, and they've worked quite well for keeping the, um, the, the, pest, uh, the, the birds and squirrels out. Um, so you might say, well, these are kind of, they are kind of hard to build. Um, and it, was pro it probably cost me about three, maybe $400 to build these. Um, but I went from harvesting about 15 quarts of strawberries to about 40 quarts of strawberries the first year I had them in. So it really, I, I didn't realize how much, how much I was losing to, to those pests. Um, and I'm going to show you, I have a couple other, uh, other things I do with these, which really made it more worthwhile. So basically with the strawberries alone, it probably paid for itself in two and a half years, not including my time to, to, to build them. Um, I hooked them together a, a system of just little, um, 
everything with all of these panels is exactly the same. I have, um, uh, what do you call it, um, templates. I, every piece that's used here is the same. Holes are line up and I can put these little um, boards in to, to keep them together. Um, they're easy to flip up as opposed to that other system I showed you. Um, and uh, I can cover the whole thing with plastic if I have to. Now, usually by the time I put these up, it's um, time to harvest and, and um, usually the frost is gone. But yes, go ahead and give you some. Um, do you think you can use a screen door? They look about like the same size as a screen door. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you could. Now, here's one, one thing. They are not made with two by fours. Um, I have a friend that made some, uh, some type of panel, a little different situation with two yeah. by fours, but they're awful heavy. I said, I couldn't, I couldn't handle those. They're made with just one by, one by three, they call them la la lading. It's really cheap wood. Y if you buy a bundle or you buy a bunch, you're going to get some that are curved too much to use, but you'll ha have enough that you can make these things with. So my, my guess is a screen door would probably work if you have a small situation. Yeah. Uh, and especially you can you know, take I happen work. to know how handy you are. You're quite handy. So I'm, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that I might injure my hand hammering a nail into anything. So I'm thinking like screen door might be totally the right option. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll go back a bit. Um, I tried covering these with netting at first. And I find that the, um, even before, uh, uh, yeah, well, um, and uh, you know, the birds and the squirrels can kind of pick through the netting. The squirrels are kind of interesting. They would get in there. They would take one uh, strawberry up to the top of the fence, eat it, and then go back for, for twice more <laughs> in the morning and then in the evening. I think they did it at least twice a day, maybe more. So I figured each squirrel was eating six strawberries a day. So, you know, if you have a big patch, that may be something you can deal with. But I, I again, with, between them and the cat birds, I just didn't realize how much I was losing. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, get away from the pest for a minute. Um, strawberries, uh, it, this is the patch at the end of June. It stopped producing. The leaves by this time are turning yellow. You know, it puts a lot of energy into producing that fruit. I basically go in there with a scythe or it could be, it could be a lump. And I just cut the tops down, cut them high. Uh, cause you don't want to, uh, ruin the, the base of the plant cause the base is, uh, is going to start producing new leaves and getting ready for next year's crop. Um, this is, uh, this is probably that one of the, a similar bed, a couple, you know, probably a month. It's probably late July. Uh, and it's starting to produce, uh, you know, new plants for the next year. Um, and this would, would be the end of, um, uh, August. Uh, you know, the second, uh, will be actually going into the you know, second year. So it's, it's already been a year and a half since I planted these guys and uh, it's producing new plants for the next year. Basically, it's the same plant uh, uh, coming up from the same planting stock, um, but it's just producing a new plant that's, uh, or new greens and it eventually produces new berries. Um, okay, uh, I like uh, uh, the cane fruit. Um, and I'll show you uh, some of my system for why I chose the varieties. Uh, is because of my use of my cages. Um, this is uh, fall, fall raspberries. Um, I plant them once, uh, they fill in the bed. I've got about 100 square feet. It's in a triangular area, so I can't give the dimensions. Um, and I get about, on a good year, I get about uh, a half a pint. You know, half a pint is what they sell uh, Driscoll's raspberries for in the store in the summertime. Uh, so I keep some of those to harvest and I've gotten as much as a hundred pint, a half pint. So it's about a, a half pint per square foot. Um, so, okay, this is, uh, these plants were cut down to the ground after they, they start, stop producing in the fall and the roots will just send up new shoots each spring. This is probably, um, early to mid May plants are starting to come up and this is what that, that, uh, looks like that patch looks like in um, uh, mid June. So it's you know, a lot of greenery in there. It's filling in nicely, uh, and then it starts producing fruit. Uh, it, it produces fruit usually starting in uh, uh, August. You know, you get a few things here and there in, in July, but um, I basically the birds get those. Uh, I don't worry about those. Um, 
and um, okay, I did make a mistake one time. You saw my soil test from a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago, and this patch, which only gets leaves for fertility, uh, leaves year after year, uh, had a, had a low count of boron. I tried putting some borax on. Uh, basically, boron is my mineral, and uh, the recommended rate is three pounds per acre, uh, and I. Uh, you know, it's hard to judge that, so I overdid it, and I actually killed a whole section. Now, boron does not last a long time in the soil, so I was able to replant this next year, and it, and it came back. Um, it, it only was, was one year. So, okay, I'm going to get back into the cages. Um, remember my um, blueberry cage, I mean, my strawberry cages. This is, aside from a, a, a second, uh, a gate I had to make for the raspberries and the blueberries, they're the same components as I use for my strawberries. They are now standing up straight and I, I hook them together the same way I, I did for the for the strawberries. Um, and uh, one additional um, uh, over the top, uh, I have a netting. So basically this is protecting my raspberries from, um, from the birds. Uh, you notice the back of my fence here. I had to reinforce it. I put these two by fours at the top of the fence so I could go with these. These poles in the middle are, are, are 10 foot long uh, conduit, electrical conduit pipes. I've got clamps um, so it uh, basically holds them in place. Uh, and that's what holds the netting up. The netting, uh, I believe on your um, resource guide, uh, give me a second because I can't remember the name of the company. Um, uh, uh, I may not have, uh, Ken, I think it's Ken Cove. Uh, no, Farm Tech. Uh, it's on page eight of your um, resource guide. Farm Tech has this one inch mesh uh, netting um, and it's a hundred feet by, I can't remember how wide it is, 12 or 16 feet. And uh, it, it was about perfect for my beds. I cut it in half. Uh, I've used half of it for about eight years now. I'm still using the same same piece. I patched it up. It was only it was a hundred dollars. So again, it was another investment. Um, but it looks like this is going to last me for twenty years because when this when this piece is 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 worn out, I'm just going to use a second piece that I've never used before. So, um, okay, again, uh, the the one component that's different from the strawberries, I had to build a separate gate. Uh, that's a gate and the panel on on it right on the right is part of that gate system. Um, and it, it opens in with the um, raspberries, but uh, blueberries is my third crop. Um, and um, you can see, uh, okay, I'm gonna talk about uh, flowering. Um, each one of those little flowers can turn into a, a should turn into a blueberry. Now, uh, in the years that I've been growing blueberries, I'm getting better and better at it. Uh, and getting better and better at it is making the plants grow bigger and producing more fruit. Um, but one thing you need to watch for is that once it hits this stage, uh, again, the blueberries can be susceptible to frost. Now, my blueberries actually started blossoming before my strawberries did this year, even though they will actually produce fruit a month later. I can't figure out why that happens, but uh, blueberries, once it flowers, it's just a much slower process of producing the fruit. But at this stage, it is susceptible to frost, and, and only a few years have to have the um, flowers come out early enough that I need to worry about frost. 2017, or I think it was 17, I actually lost all my fruit except for one plant because I was not expecting uh, uh, late frost to do the damage. But now, uh, this was this morning, um, I actually covered the blueberries two or three times this, this past month. I think three, three or four times. Um, there are some varieties there that probably that don't have many flowers and I probably didn't need to cover them all, but I, I want to uh, make sure I get every blueberry I can. Um, so I, I'm not going to get into planting. If you, you um, can get good planting stock, again, the same two sources, Starks and Nurses, Norses, um, and they will give you directions on planting. This is a um, from probably a two-year-old plant. Um, as you see, it's the same, actually the same day as the plant you saw with all the flowers. It did have flowers on it, but it's very small. So um, I picked those flowers off. The reason I did that is because, because the plant is still small. I wanted 
to put energy into growing a larger plant because ne next year it will give me a lot more fruit. And this is an example, I think it was the same year, same plant. Um, you can see uh, top right hand side of your screen, there's two new canes coming up there, one from the ground, one from another branch. Um, and they're increasing the size of this plant. I've got a couple other pictures. Actually, um, this is the same plant several years later. Um, actually, this, this was today. Um, and let me get the arrow out. Uh, oops. Okay. Um, this was the size of the plant last year. And it was, there was my, pr I pruned this heavily last year. Uh, because some of the, the uh, branches were getting kind of old and they were still fairly small. Where last year it produced two nice new canes, uh, uh, shoots, I guess you call them, and blueberries. And you can see it's almost, uh, you can't even see the top there. It's, just, it's almost double the size of the blueberry plant. Now this will start to branch out. Uh, both of these will start to branch out and it'll produce a lot bigger plant. Um, I'll eventually um, cut out the old smaller one and uh, I'll have a new larger plant on my myself. Okay, again, I use the same system. Strawberries come in in May and early June. Blueberries start to come in in June. Uh, and uh, my, my fall raspberries in uh, late July, August. So I'm using the same components as, as, as my, um, you know, caging. Again, I've got the gate. Um, but so this really, I, I figured the year I built this, I went from harvesting my raspberries. I didn't get it finished until raspberry season. But I went from harvesting probably an average of about you know, 30, those half pints of raspberries to that, you know, the first year I had it in, it was 100. So it practically paid for itself the, the first year. Um, and again, if, if anybody lives close by and want to come take a look at this in the summertime, you're welcome to stop in. Um, I've tried some other systems. Uh, that's that one inch square mesh. I made a circle around blueberries and it kept the birds out, it kept the squirrels out, but it was really hard to harvest. Uh, it was hard to take this apart and open up the circle and once, uh, and so instead I would just reach over the top but it was difficult. And um, that's a, a netting, it's not the same one I now use, uh, it's, um, but part of this dropped onto the ground and I actually caught a snake in there, I actually killed a snake uh, not on purpose. That snake was there because I had voles, which I didn't know at the time, but I found out from a later uh, infestation. Um, but I, you know, I did not help myself out. So it's possible to do this um, uh, simpler system, but it's a little harder to harvest. Um, we're going to show you a couple of neighbors, Mike and Louise Alcott, who live in Pennington, New Jersey. They have a much more extensive blueberry um, area than I do. And those are, again, those electrical conduit pipes. They're 10 foot long, but uh, in this particular case, uh, <clears throat> that's a 15 foot arch. So they cut some of them in half and they, uh, I'll show you in a minute, they actually hook some of them together. So they get a 15 foot arch and then they put that agribon, the, the reme over it, uh, sorry, the um, row cover. Um, it's probably a much larger piece than, than I would tell you to buy. Uh, the ones I use in the garden are 86 inches long. They have them in all widths. This one's probably at least 20 foot. Uh, you know, 20 foot wide, probably even more than that. Basically, it just lays on the ground. I, I don't know if they have, uh, st uh, not stakes, but um, you know, wood or bricks or something on top of it. To, but they said it works quite well. And, but again, their, their um, blueberry patch is quite a bit more extensive than mine. Um, I think that's it, Nagisa. Um, yeah, I, sorry I ran you guys over a little bit, but um, not as bad as the it's some of the other <laughs> um, and I will stay on for questions. Um, is my screen okay? I can stop share. Yeah. Do you find that strawberries attract mice? I had heard that, and and I thought that it had happened to me at one point in Michigan, and so I just stopped growing them. And I would really like to go back to growing them, but I'm afraid of them attracting more critters. Well, you know, sometimes I see some damage even under the cages that I'm not sure what it's from. It could be very well to me that, that it is. Now I, my garden shed is uh, you know, 15 feet away from the garden and I do have mice Hours. overwintering in that shed sometimes. So I try to be more aggressive about controlling them because I think that that's probably where they're coming from. 
Um, but yeah, I think they probably can. Uh, so the, 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 the um, so here, the one thing about mice is they will try to find winter shelter. So if you have a good place to shelter, you know, like a garden shed, um, they'll build nests there, but they're hungry. So that's a good time you can catch them with traps. Um, this winter, I actually kind of forgot about that because I didn't have much of a problem last year. And, and, and it's possibly that I'm going to have a problem this year. So try to remember in the, in the fall is when you cut that mouse population down. Um, and hopefully it'll, it'll reap benefits in, in the spring. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Al. Hey, Richard. You referenced um, earlier garlic spray. Um, and, you know, isn't there a way to make your own garlic spray and, uh, you know, uh, reduce costs? Yeah, uh, there is. Um, uh, I mean, I've never done it. Um, I, I off, I think I uh, told you last week when I, when it comes to, um, the potato squash vine borer, I just crush, you know, I crush a, a clove of garlic at the base of each plant. But I think if you crush that and, and leave, left it in water, um, I would think you could do that. I mean, you know, maybe even put it in a blender. I would think it would harm to get little pieces of garlic out there. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't here last week because of the uh, speaker problem with the uh, microphone problem. Oh but, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and then also the copper tubes for yeah, slugs. Yeah. There is a copper spray that works, I would guess, as well for slugs or no? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, uh, to, to um, is a little bit of an explanation. Copper, um, uh, again, it's a, it's a mine mineral and, and there are copper, copper sulfate sprays that are, that are uh, uh, allowed for organic, that are effective at controlling some diseases. I've never tried them for slugs. I don't know that they would be on and heavy enough. Um, uh, I don't think the copper is concentrated enough to have the same effect, but that's just my guess. Okay. 